all Bible, all the time. And the Bible's our Paul, and I'm here with Producer Million. Well, we have a kind of a little different show today, Producer Million. How different? A, a, it's not strictly Bible, but it's a spiritual book we're going to talk about. Okay. Also kind of a paranormal sci-fi thriller. Maybe a few other genres in there that our guest will tell us about when uh, he just talks about the book that he wrote. And uh, the, he was kind enough to, uh, or the czar was able to obtain a copy and, and read it. And it was really, it was a real page turner. You know, we'll see what's going to happen next. And you know, he tied all the stuff together. He had all kind of cool czar references to Star Trek and nice. a few other things. So, which shows his inner dorkness, but I would never say that about him, you know, when he's listening on the, no, I just did. So, but we have uh, Dave Reynolds, who also goes by for his uh, writing, D. Doyle Reynolds, and uh, we'll let him explain that, uh, why he did that. It's actually pretty straightforward, but Dave, we, we're going to go with Dave Reynolds for the show. Is that okay? That sounds wonderful. Yes. All right. Uh, yeah, you, you, know, you put your finger on I mean, the reason why I did it is because uh, if you go out there and you want to publish a book or do anything public at all, you're going to kind of search for your name, and it's kind of uh, a, little, a little jarring to go out there and find that there are about, you know, 9 million Dave Reynolds out there. And uh, so I thought, well, okay, let's go with my middle name. And Doyle is not a real common name. In fact, when I was a kid, I used to get teased for a lot, you know, that kind of thing. So I thought, well, surely not too many people have that name. So I'll just, maybe I'll just go by the name of Doyle Reynolds. Well, there are a few less Doyle Reynolds, but still a number of them. So, okay, D. Doyle Reynolds was, was thus formed. I mean, I, I could have come up with uh, something like, uh, you know, Mickey Spillane or something like that, but that name was taken, so... <laughs> So, yeah, and plus, especially when you have to put up a website and all the rest of that kind of stuff, uh, to find a unique name is uh, pretty difficult. Now, and one of the great quirks of scheduling that I've seen, our guest on the History Czar that we're going to tape next is named Robert Doyle. Can you imagine that? And it was to totally, not, totally not by design, I can tell you that. So uh, it, illustrates, it illustrates my point. That's right. Well, well it's, it's, not, it's not that common, and there is two in the same... Uh, uh, day. Well, why don't you tell us about your background experience, and then we'll get right into your book. Okay. Well, my background experience is I uh, spent about a dozen years, this is my professional experience anyway, spent about a dozen years on a, a naval base, which is a, I actually use that um, in the context of my book, Shift, um, Point Magoo Navy Base, where uh, I worked for a defense contractor for about a dozen years. I was project manager for them. And uh, I did have some fun with it. I did use some special knowledge that I had of, of uh, the way the base works and the types of things the government worked on, and then the rest is greatly embroidered. You know, I just had fun with it. Write what you know. Isn't that what they tell you in your, your first year writing classes? Is write what you know. So that's what I did. And then I, after that, I spent about... Uh, five years in San Diego um, working with an up-and-coming uh, movie company. Um, we had a lot of seed money, and we were, we were growing and growing, and things were happening and developing, and things got kind of exciting. And then um, abruptly, one of the main events that happened was 9-11 happened, and um, some of the, the uh, investment sources, a couple of the, the major banks, I'm, I'm not going to name at this point, that were really interested in looking at film funding and so forth. They, they just quit calling. The phone calls dried up. Uh, the, people were kind of freaked out about what was going on with the, the country and where things were going. And so, you know, discussions happened, layoffs started happening, and things kind of pulled back. So it's kind of a sad thing. Um, but as, as far as, as being a, a Christian, I, I asked Jesus into my life when I was in the uh, junior high. So, you know, it's a relatively young age. Um, I, I grew up very God-conscious and very God-aware, and this is this will kind of date me a little bit. This is back when we used to play a lot of Jesus movies and things on TV per, pretty regularly, um, especially during the holidays. You know, you could watch Ben Hur uncut on television, and people knew what it was, and it wasn't the, uh, wasn't the cable version that was uh, skating and worldly. Spartacus was not at all what you see now on cable channels. 
the original Spartacus movie that they played during the holidays was very Christ-centered. So I, I kind of grew up with that, although not in a Christian home. I kind of grew up with that and aware of that and had this longing and yearning. And then someone shared their faith with me, and I prayed to receive Christ and grew up and matured from there. So let's see, what else do, I, what else do you need to know? Well, how much are you worth? And <laughs> uh, and, and you and you your other professional life. You've worked in uh, as a retail manager. While you've uh, pursued a, a writing interest, correct? Yep, yep. That's how I feed my feed my family. Um, Lord willing, if it's His will, then um, you know He'll bless the work and, and the projects will grow and keep going, and, and we'll see what happens with that. But uh, yeah, that's the way I feed my family. Is a uh, uh, retail management, and um, it's not very forgiving during the holidays. But you know, I, I'm not going to complain. It's it's not my original choice of work because it, I mean, it's kind of out of left field the way I got it. But you know, with so many people unemployed, um, I am just so thankful to be working at this time. Well, same here. So uh, well, let's talk about the book a little bit. Uh, why did you write it in the first place? Well, you know. Uh, um, Desire and I have known each other for over over ten years now, and um, when we first met, uh, you knew me as, as somebody who who does um, some graphic works, and I worked on screenplays and I rewrote screenplays and so forth. Originally, my heart's desire, shortly after I came to know the Lord in junior high, was I wanted to write. I wanted to be a writer. I didn't know exactly what, but I thought books, I, and I kind of got pulled. Aside from that, a little bit with screenplays, and I, I dabbled in that for quite a while. After things kind of fell apart with that uh, movie company in San Diego, I pulled back from writing for a while, and I, I kind of felt a little kicked in the gut, as it were, and didn't know how to move. I was reevaluating everything, uh, and so my wife said, "Well, you know what? Why don't you consider writing books? That's what you originally wanted to start in the first place. There aren't so many chefs in the kitchen." not so many hands in the mix, you know, it'd be your project. Why don't you just kind of go down that road? So I thought about it and prayed about it. And I uh, I love fiction, and I, I love fiction that is where you can stretch as far as possible believability and yet still make it somewhat believable. You know, where you want to, you want to at least suspend your dis- disbelief for the sake of the story. And um, this, is, this is my stab at that. I don't know how far I suspended disbelief, but um, I, I just had fun with it. And, and, and also, the, you put your finger on it, too, when you mentioned all the elements of some science fiction, some suspense, some thriller. It is very much a mixed genre type of a, a book. And it came about by uh, looking at just supposing from the book of Ephesians, where it talks about, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers of darkness, and so forth. If you're not familiar with that passage and you're listening to this, you need to get familiar with it because, my friends, we are in spiritual warfare each and every day. And it's not that just that we're kind of wandering around aimlessly and these angels and demons in, in um, some of the dimension and realm around us are kind of fighting and battling, which they probably are. But we are part of that battle, too, enough that we're enough so that Paul knew he had to um, warn the saints to put on the whole armor of Jesus Christ. And um, why would he do that if we're not really in the battle, if it's not really our battle, if it's not really about us? Yeah, Dave, I'm going to jump I'm gonna jump in right there. Uh, we'll pause, we'll take a break, and then we'll come back. We'll have you finish up talking about the battle and uh, continue talking about your book. You're listening to The Bible Czar, all Bible, all the time. Bible all the time. I'm the Bible's our Paul, and I'm here with producer Million. We're, we're talking with Dave Reynolds today about his spiritual sci-fi suspense thriller. That's what I decided to call it. Cool. It's, it's, it has a major spiritual elements, and uh, Dave, we're going to get right in the, the book's called Shift, and we're going to get right back to where you uh, left off. So you're talking about Paul and the uh, battle uh, that uh, with uh, demons and principalities of darkness, I think it is, in Ephesians. So go ahead, pick up your train of thought there, and then we'll continue to talk about the book. Okay, well, very good. Uh, what I decided to do with Shift was to um, 
like I said before, just kind of say just opposing those two worlds did collide. The barrier came down between these two dimensions. However, God has the universe laid out. And um, what would it look like if there was um, a kind of a microcosm, a collision of these two worlds? Um, we walk around very blind. Uh, day to day, we get wrapped up in the world around us. Um, and, and not necessarily wrongly so. We, we've got jobs to attend to. We have families to take care of. We have yards to mow. Um, but at the same time, we need to be aware that the, of the spiritual battle that's around us. Well, what would the reaction be if they did collide? What would that look like? So this is kind of my take on a way that it might look if um, we had the small town of Ventura, which is a, uh, a place I did live when I worked at the Point of Navy Base, and uh, an experiment badly, horribly goes wrong. And so it kind of creates a, um, okay, this is a spoiler alert, kind of creates a, um, a bubble um, around a segment of town of about a, a mile to two miles where it kind of rips that section of town into another dimension. You know, like the Twilight Zone maybe, I don't know. Anyway, into the spiritual realm, that section of town is kind of taken in there, and things start happening. Um, and I don't want to give too much away as far as that goes, but there are demonic forces around, and and there are also angelic forces around, and the spiritual battle is going around these people. And um, the book is very much about how these people view what's going on. We have... Uh, a character too who says, "What is going on here? Are, are these um, are these aliens? You know, look at these creatures here. What do they look like? I think they maybe came from another planet. And other people think it's spiritual. Um, have another character in there. Um, her name is Karen, and she's completely in, in denial about what's going on at all. Is that anything, you know, too extraordinary? Other than a big storm is going on, and there's um, maybe some wild animals loose or something. So." Uh, I, I tried to kind of catch a microcosm of, of different reactions of people, how they would likely react in today's world, and uh, what their response is, and try to be true to those characters along the way. And, and people's hearts change along the way, and um, they start laying plans for how we're going to stick together, and, and they start realizing what's going on because they find this barrier um, on the outside of town, so they know that something's not quite right. That's in the midst of all this, you know, God usually has his people um, at the right place at the right time. You know, whether it's, uh, you know, a, a right man for the season, like in Elijah, or uh, in this particular case, it's, it's just a young girl who God is uniquely um, prepared with a special ability. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, synesthesia, I believe is what it's called, and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing it, but some people... Um, they, some of the uh, synapses in the brain or, or whatever is going on kind of cross over. Some people claim that they've been able to smell colors or they see sounds in the form of color. Different weird things happen like this. I, there was a special on Discovery Channel a while back that was uh, very interesting, and, and they were demonstrating this. Sometimes it's kind of a crossover, and I don't know if that's if they're... Um, a better example of the way our brains are supposed to work originally during the creation or if it's um, a horrible mutation. I don't know which way it goes. But anyway, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon that happens sometimes with some people. This little girl, she's got a special ability. She's only five years old, very smart, kind of precocious, um, very fun, and it, nobody knows she has this ability until it, it, it comes out and she starts to reveal it to her babysitter um, at the time of, uh, that the story takes place. She's at her babysitter's house in this part of town where this happens. So this unique giftedness that she has, God uses to, to try to save that chunk of town and to get them back home. So um, how that works into spiritual warfare needs to be read to understand. But uh, that's kind of, um, in a nutshell, it's kind of the direction the story goes. And uh, from there, it's all it's uh, the suspense and the thriller and the sci-fi and the um, um, you know the spiritual thing. Let's let's take a little bit tack, so we're not doing too many spoiler alerts. Here is uh, you know why did you pick a young girl to be your main character? Um, I, I'm asked that a lot sometimes, you know, frequently. Like sometimes I I scratch my head and I say why did I do this myself? But 
because it, it, it really limits you in your writing. It's very tough because when I when I go into the different characters, I kind of go into their voice a little bit, into their heads a little bit, so it's, it could be kind of tricky. But at the same time, um, I, I do remember the reason why I originally did it is because I, I like the idea of the innocence of children and um, how that they don't question everything and self-doubt as much in, in a lot of ways that adults do. Uh, they take things on face value. So um, she didn't try to, wouldn't try to mix up the situation with her own baggage. She can't have a lot of baggage at the age of five. And, um, you know, just the, the whole notion of, uh, you know, and a little child shall leave them kind of a, an idea where um, she's just accepting of, of her condition, doubtful the way people accept it, afraid that, you know, very aware and afraid that just from watching too many movies and TV shows that if somebody found out, even her parents, that, you know, the guys in the white coats might carry her away and want to um, dissect her and see what makes her tick. So she keeps it very quiet, it's kind of dodgy that way, but at the same time, um, just accepting that it's, it's something that she has and she does for whatever reason. Also, she encounters her her guardian angel, and um, so she's very accepting of, of this and his direction throughout the story. So uh, that's the main reason. I like to take a story, and, and like I said, I like to bend it as far as possible. So there's some of that element, kind of a fantasy element in, in the story and some science fiction. But then there's also some of the sense, because a lot of times we, we jump outside of that realm into the frantic reaction of FEMA, the Navy, the police on the outside of this. I mean, a, a big chunk of Ventura disappeared. They try to cover it up by saying, well, uh, wow, there's a, you know, something happened. There's a big sinkhole, a big part of town disappeared, and it filled up with the Pacific Ocean. You know, how do we sequester all the people? How do we contain this? They know that the, the Navy's experiment, that device they had that went wrong, was part of the cause of that. Well, heads are going to roll. How do we kind of cover this up? How do we contain this? So we go into that outside almost in kind of a... Um, uh, more of a, a Tom Clancy type of a suspense uh, government angle, uh, only without as good a writing as Tom Clancy. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that, but uh, it's it's a wide ranging book in terms of the amount of characters you had and uh, the different things you would have to know about uh, to bring the story together. So it's kind of fun that way because you get the government angle, you have the spiritual. Um, material in there you have the demons material you have uh, fun sci-fi references because you're sci-fi buff like the czars and uh, uh, those types of things so we're going to come back we're talk more about uh, shift uh, with dave reynolds uh, after the break you're listening to the bible czar all bible all the time Bible all the time on the Bible's Our Paul. I'm here with producer Million, and we're talking with Dave Reynolds today about his uh, spiritual sci-fi suspense thriller shift. Uh, producer Million, just want to see if anything has uh, come to mind on your side of the desk before we move forward. Spiritual warfare is definitely probably my favorite topic. I got to tell you, I love that kind of stuff. And uh, you were saying about how. Uh, the experience tied into this book. Now, not everybody likes to uh, always go into this, but was any of it based on personal experience? Well, a little bit. I mean, um, it's surprising. Maybe it shouldn't be, but it's surprising how many people I've talked talk to um, through the who've had something uh, something bad that they dabbled in or saw that they normally don't like to share. Sometimes, because of the nature of some of the, the uh, churches we grew up in, we're not as free to discuss those things. We, we're afraid people are going to look at us with kind of uh, glassy eyes and kind of shake their heads at us or something if we share these experiences. And uh, it depends on, on how either um, drastically conservative the church is that you attend or maybe in the other extreme and radically uh, charismatic um, and somewhere in between. You might feel more and more, more or less uh, at liberty to discuss some of those things that have happened. But, um, you know, I mean, I, I grew up during an area where it seemed like so many people grew up with Ouija boards, and, and it seems like everybody's either had or heard of a Ouija board experience. And, um, you know, so some bad things have uh, happened out of that. And then I, I knew of a case personally where the whole point is that this stuff goes on and people mess with this stuff, and they don't know what they're messing with. I, I see previews for that show on cable all the time where people go ghost hunting and things and it's I feel like man you have no idea what you guys are messing with you're out looking for a cute little Casper the friendly ghost that's moving furniture around in the house and you 
got no idea. So yeah, the long and short of it is the stuff goes on around us. The church doesn't probably talk to, talk about it enough. Can we talk about it too much and that can become our focus? Yes. Um, I think so many times people are looking around every corner and under every bush for demons and, and focusing on, on the dark side and, and not focusing on the glory of Christ and what we have in Christ and the victory that we have in Christ. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit if we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, which is the reason why um, I personally believe the Bible um, is pretty clear that you cannot be a Christian and be possessed. People have disagreed with me in the past on that. But I, I look at it this way. Dr. Walter Martin, who's now gone on to be with the Lord, used to say years ago, there's no such thing as duplex Christianity with the Holy Spirit living upstairs and demon downstairs. Um, when you think of your body as the temple of the Holy Spirit, and you think of the high priest and, and the, what they had to go through in the Old Testament days to purify themselves and sacrifice so that the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies to make the sacrifice. And he had to have a rope tied around his ankle, tradition tells us, so that if something happened and he wasn't right with God and he went in there with an impure heart and he died, the other priest could drag him out. Okay, well, a Holy of Holy place that is actually that within us as believers, do you really see a demon going in there and be able to live in there and exist in there at all? And they can influence us, and we can go in there in the flesh. You know, we we need to put on the helmet of salvation, protect our, our minds, the breastplate of righteousness, whatever. Sin and baggage we're carrying day to day in our lives, we need to daily take it to the cross and, and keep ourselves right with Him. And um, so, I don't know, did I, did I answer your question? <laughs> I know Wonderful. I kind of, I <laughs> Love the answer. I would take that as a yes. <laughs> Uh, in the book, I, I wanted to kind of approach, I wanted to be true to how um, the reaction of, of demonic forces and people with them might be if, if that kind of stuff was going on around them. And they're in this battle, and, and because the, the demons are in their physical world, their physical weapons, guns, whatever, seem to work, and they don't know exactly where they're going. Okay, I shoot a demon, and, and it, it vaporizes, it turns and go. I mean, does it, is it banished to Tartarus or what? I don't know, but just keep shooting kind of a thing. Um, so it's kind of a, a fun battle, kind of a scary battle at the same time, but um, during the, in the midst of, of uh, the characters and the reaction to what's going on around them, I, I, I want to catalyze a little bit the world, and this book to be a fun read for unbelievers who uh, like to read and like a little bit scary stories, like suspense, maybe like science fiction, but at the same time, I want to sneak a little bit of gospel in there. I, I, and I've got one character in there who is a uh, an ordained minister. He's a pastor. He's kind of came out of a, a, a gang background, but um, he very much shares the gospel here and there with some people. Some people believe him, some people don't, so I kind of get some real reactions in there, but it's, uh, the book is intended to be a good tool to to buy and hand off to somebody who's not a believer but likes to read those kind of books and might accidentally get a little bit of the gospel. And I also wanted some believers who read it to become a little bit more aware and maybe attuned to the spiritual realm around them and what's going on. Fair enough. Excellent uh, question. And uh, that takes us right to the break. So we'll take that break and come back. You're listening to The Bible Czar, all Bible, all the time. On the Bible's our Paul, and I'm here with producer Million. That was good. I could take the last segment off. Let you ask a question, and Dave goes on with a brilliant answer, and uh, then I say, let's take a break. I yeah, like that. Listeners, you ran out and got a sandwich, and you didn't bring me anything back. I never bring you anything back. I basically don't care about you. Did I, Dave? I mentioned that. Some you know, as part of my Christian walk, is not caring about you. <laughs> yes, you're shedding me from I'm, your... I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm shedding, but it was mostly the hair on top of my head, but that's a whole other story. Anyway, uh, we're talking about with uh, Dave Reynolds today about his book, Shift, a uh, spiritual sci-fi suspense thriller. And uh, I got to get the one thing in there, Dave, that I liked is when you had said Geraldo was a putz. I mean, a little, little, little editorial <laughs> commentating there I got out of that one. Now, now so, let's be clear. I I didn't say that one of my characters did. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. I get confused. I don't think we need to worry about him actually listening to this show. So as as, okay, as a great reach that we eat now. Okay. Anyway, we're going to do the blatant plug portion of the show, Dave. So I know you have a website for the book, and there's probably other places people can uh, find it and give out the exact title and uh, obviously the uh, author name that it's under, etc. Okay. Well, the, uh, the answer is pretty simple. It's... Um dot com. So um, it's available as an ebook through Smashwords, 
and um, uh, 299 that way. It's also available for various devices. Logos recently came out with their Verso app, and um, so it's also available for, for the Verso app, and I believe they have it for just 269 um, they set their own price in there, so I, I think that's kind of cool. But it's also available as a physical book through CreateSpace, and um, uh, most people or many people still really like a good old-fashioned book to hold in their hands, and I would be one of them. got this mission, as I tried to articulate, of, of helping the believer become a little bit more aware of the spiritual realm around them and, and also maybe giving the believer a tool to get in the hands of um, their unbelieving friends. Maybe catalyze them, tease them with a, uh, a little bit of a fun experience exciting story. Um, it's it's not gratuitous with violence or language at all. Um, although some of the, the violence might be um, described a little bit, it's not it's not very gratuitous in that way at all. In fact, uh, early on, my 12-year-old daughter wanted to read the story, and we sat down and, and read it together, and uh, you know we discussed it along the way. She really enjoyed it. She had some parts that she thought were kind of spooky and wanted to explain, and that's what we did. But uh, so, you know, it might be PG, but it's it's not uh, it's not gruesome by any stretch. Fair enough. Uh, let's get, have you quickly let us know what's next. Uh, do you have you have a second book in this series uh, you're thinking about? I I, I found one that I'm, I'm more than thinking about. I've, I've got copious notes, and I and what I tend to do is I tend to flood myself with as much on the topic as possible, and do all the research and take lots of notes and. Then put it all in there, and then I sit down at the keyboard and, and kind of see what comes out, and then I refer to my notes. Um, so, so, they sp- so the, it's going to expand, it gets more global, more people interested, and uh, it, it's just going to go to the next level from this start uh, in uh, Ventura, it sounds like. Yeah. Exactly. All right. So we'd like to have the guests get the last word. So uh, just give us a summation of you know what you'd like people to get out of this book if they read it. Well, um, as I said, what I'd like people to get out of the book is that I want them to enjoy themselves. Um, Jesus is a great storyteller. Um, a lot of people have trouble sometimes with Christian fiction and that kind of thing. Well, Jesus taught, educated through stories, parables, um, using fictitious characters. And um, that's all I wanted to do, although obviously not as well as Jesus did and as succinctly, but I just want to communicate with people and, and give them some tools to fit the thinking and uh, maybe get them to sit down with their Bibles and read it a little bit more and find out what's going on in their walk with the Lord and, and things that matter. This world that we live in now is just a shadow. The real world is, is the one that we've yet to see, um, the one that we're going to go into eternally. Uh, for good or for bad. So I'm, I'm hoping that people can use this as a, as a tool for their unbelieving friends and that Christians will kind of wake up and want to crack the Bible open and read some more because much of what I put in there is just based on biblical principles and it's just fleshing it out. Dave, thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. So what'd you think of that one, producer Millian? Good stuff. Oh, I like that kind of stuff, definitely. Well, if you're nice to me, I'll let you take the book. You can read it. It's a oh, good book. Thank you. Absolutely. Just give it back. Do I have to? You, no, you can do whatever you want with it, and you tell <laughs> lie to me, and then go to hell. But you know, hey, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> yeah, because I'm going to give it to Steve Hayes, our good friend Steve Hayes. After uh, you read it, so no rush to get it. You know, read it. But uh, okay, well, well, we'll work that out. You work that out. Well, you got a wife and a child and everything, yeah. so you reading time is. But it's a pretty, uh, it's a, it's a, a good page turner and, and not a hard read. A um, lot in there. But it's not like you know War and Peace or something like that. Uh, no Tolstoy, so, Tolstoy stuff. Or? No, no Tolstoy. Which you know, three years later, you're like, I was a young man when I started this book. So <laughs> I think enjoy. I think you'll enjoy it. So um, you've read War and Peace, haven't you? No, actually, I read. Yeah. I read Anna Karenina in um, okay uh, all of it. It's like my God, like wow. 900 pages or something like that in uh, in uh, college. You listen to the Bible Czar, all Bible, all the time. time.